Mr. Schaff called me when I was 25 and first met him. He said, Mr. Owen, in my personal opinion, financial independence is a worthy goal. Now, he really said that for a reason because a lot of people are having problems with financial independence simply because they have some moral issues really confused in their minds about the value of money or the danger of money or having too much money or that the true values of life are not wrapped up in money. So money really doesn't matter that much. And some people have some problems in this area. And I'll admit I had some when I first started making more money in one month than my father made in one year. At first, I was very disturbed by that, and guess what? For a long time, I wouldn't even tell my parents. I didn't tell them. I said, what are they going to think? I make more money in one month than my father makes in one year. How can I tell them? And I was really confused about that. I was really bothered by that for quite a while. I think it was several months. No, because here's when it ended. I finally worked up the courage to tell them how I was doing. I can't remember now just how I put it. I was just trying to figure out some way to put it right to break the news to them so you know it wouldn't be too great a shock when I told them what I was doing and what was happening and what was going on. They were just incredibly delighted. They were terribly happy, terribly excited. And I discovered that I'd worried and been bothered all those months for nothing because I had this in my mind. How am I going to justify it? How am I going to work this whole thing out? How are they going to feel? And sure enough, I had just conjured all this stuff up in my mind, and it really was not real. But some people really have some problems with financial independence because they feel that the morality of earning lots of money is a very valid question. Every once in a while, someone after my seminar says, I think you talk too much about money success, and that's not where the good life is. The good life is not just money and success and making a lot of money and doing well financially. And I understand that. I really do, and I have pondered those subjects all these years. And I don't want it to make it seem like just going for money or financial success is where the true values are. They're not. And hopefully in my seminar, I've got enough in there to try not to mislead people that I'm just thinking of financial success. But Mr. Shaw said to me, in my opinion, financial independence is a worthwhile objective. He said, Jim, once you get money out of the way, you can't believe the other dimensions of your life you can work on. Once you solve the money problem, he said, now you'll have the time, more time to work on certain other projects of your life that will really start to grow and expand. So he said, for that reason, I think financial independence is a worthwhile objective. And I know part of it is a moral question. There is a Bible phrase that says, the love of money is the root of all evil. But I'm sure the phrase is probably more correct in saying the love of money, the love of money. Now, when I did start getting some of those big bonus checks way back in those early days, my first crack at money, right, I wasn't too worried about whether or not it was going to ruin me. One of my friends, his wealthy friend, when he started making a lot of big money, said, Robert, I don't know if I should give you all this big money or not. You know, money's ruined a lot of people. And Robert said, just try me one time. I mean, let's just see. So we're all willing to go through it, I'm sure, that first time. But I know it is a moral question. Sometimes it's something you just have to wrestle with. Financial independence is not something you have to throw away all other values to acquire. You don't have to throw them all away. Now, you could, and that would be foolish if there's half a dozen major values, and you threw away five to go from one. T, that would be foolish. But in my opinion, you really don't have to. But now, in the moral question, for those who pressed me a little bit about talking too much about money and finance and being successful, I have another question in response. Sharpening up my debating skills. And here's my question. If you could do better, should you? That's pretty good on my side of the debate, right? If you could do better, should you? Sometimes people use the moral question as an excuse to be lazy and not to improve. Then, on the other side, part of it is just the challenge to see what you can become, regardless of what the amount is. A man said to me one time, Well, mister, I'm making about $50,000 a year. Isn't that enough? And I said, yes, it's enough if you're bumping your full potential. But if you're capable of half a million pounds a year, you're somewhat of a loser. See, it's not the amount that counts, it's the extent of your reach that counts. That's what we want to do, employ the full extent of our reach. 
Whatever that amount turns out to be, if it's $5,000 a year, wonderful. If you're really extending yourself economically, doing the best you can, and those numbers turn out to be $5,000, wonderful. If it's $50,000, wonderful. If it's a half a million, wonderful. As long as you're extending yourself, your mental health, personal capacity to its limit, whatever those amounts are, those are the amounts. Because Mr. Schaff had this simple philosophy. How far should you go? Answer. As far as you can. How much should you learn? As much as you can. How many books should you read? As many as you can. How much should you earn? As much as you can. How much should you share? As much as you can. What should you accomplish? As much as you can. That's a good philosophy. What could I do in comparison to what I am doing? What could I do to extend my reach? Am I fully employed? Good question. And I think that's the answer to some of the moral question. If you're properly using your eight hours and you're extending yourself and you're doing your best, whatever that amount is, that's the amount. But financial independence is a worthwhile goal. If you can finally set money aside as being such a major object in trying to accomplish in paying the bills. And Mr. Shaw said to me, Mr. Owen, I think the only way to get money out of the way is to have plenty. So, I went for that. The time you've already set aside for labor is enough time to become wealthy. If you're working 8 to 10 hours a day, that's about it. You can't put in more than about 8 or 10. But see, if you better utilize that 8 or 10 and you double, triple, quadruple your income, see, that would be okay. Just better utilization of the time you're already spending labor in. Just a better use of it. Now, see, if you start throwing your health away by going for the money and working 20 hours a day and sliding all your friends and walking away from your family, see, now you've lost all the other values to go for one. And that would be, in my opinion, shortchanging yourself. But financial independence, let me give you just a few clues on financial independence because part of it depends on the plan you have. It isn't necessarily how hard you work or whatever else you sacrifice to go for it. You really don't have to do that. Most of us live long enough, and especially in this country of unique prosperity, we have chances enough to fairly quickly, before too long, solve the money problems of our life. One of the major reasons why most people don't is because they're operating on the wrong plan. And here's the key. It's not so much what you earn as what you do with what you earn. I think, according to the latest figures, the average person in this country now, in a working lifetime, makes half a million pounds, average in a working lifetime. The question is, at the end of the working lifetime, where is it? Now, see, some people have got it and some people haven't got it, right? They both earned it, but they both didn't keep it. And part of it is just simply operating on the wrong plan for financial independence. Here's a recommendation for a helpful book to kickstart your financial journey. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. It's a captivating read packed with insightful ideas on achieving financial independence. The book's core message revolves around a simple yet powerful principle. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Net income refers to what you have left after taxes, as that's the portion you actually get to use. As the master teacher Jesus once advised, pay Caesar first. In our context, this means allocating funds to taxes before anything else as the government takes its share up front. This concept can be translated into simpler terms for children as the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. It emphasizes the importance of preserving and nurturing our sources of income rather than squandering them recklessly. Just as you wouldn't destroy the goose that lays golden eggs, we must responsibly manage our finances to sustain our prosperity. You might say, well, the goose eats too much. Well, that may be true. Maybe we all pay a little too much in taxes, I'm sure, right? The president is trying to get through the Congress some way to reduce our taxes so the goose won't eat too much. And every goose has an inclination to eat too much, right? The government spends too much money, the goose is overweight. I understand that, but we're all a little overweight. Everything, by longevity, tends to get off course. Everything needs to be corrected, and that's just part of life. The longer something goes, the more tendency it has to eat a little too much, indulge a little too much, try to gather up a little too much power. You know, that's just natural. And the government's the same way, right? 
You hire somebody to be a servant in your house, and now they want to take over. You say, no, I hired you to take out the trash, not to run the house. But sure enough, by longevity, people just gather up, gather up, gather up, you know, more power and whatever, and then it's got to be corrected, put back in place. Everything needs to be corrected, our diet, our lives, our friendships, marriage. Everything tends to get off course, goes along pretty good, starts to drift, got to bring it back, starts to drift, bring it back, starts to drift. That's just part of life. Though the goose does overeat, I understand that, and perhaps we do pay too many taxes, and the government does spend some of our money a bit recklessly, I understand that. But see, Jesus did say, you got to take care of Caesar, because part of Caesar's responsibility is to be the goose that lays the golden eggs. We do have to have a society, we do have to have a government, or you have no market. And among the governments of the world, we do have to protect ourselves. Somebody's got to pay for the radar and the Polaris submarines and the B-missiles. Somebody's got to pay. See, I don't mind picking up my share of the radar, you know, and hire somebody to watch it and make sure they stay over there. You got to do that. So, you got to care and feed the goose. Mr. Shoth taught me to be a happy taxpayer. Now that was a whole new thing for me. Be a happy taxpayer, not a reluctant taxpayer. Okay, you got to care and feed the goose. And in this country, of course, you know, for a portion of our incomes, maybe it's a little too much. But pay it happily anyway. You know, maybe they'll straighten it out, and it'll come down a little bit or whatever. Just pay it gladly to know that we've got to have the army, the navy, the air force, the submarines, the battleships. We've got to have a show of strength. We've got to be a leader among the free world. We really do. And all that's got to be paid for. So, I don't mind picking up my share, and everybody ought to pay their share. In my personal opinion, the poorest of the poor ought to pay federal income taxes if it's only a dollar a year. So they have the sense of contributing to the care and feeding of the goose, instead of just taking. They also contribute, at least a dollar a year, the poorest of the poor, so that they have a sense of helping to pay for the safety and the security of the country. Because see, with our present Navy and Army and Air Force and the governmental structure and what safety we do have around the world keeps us here, securing our homes, right where we can work and enjoy each other's commerce, possibilities, trade goods and services, and make money, enjoy ourselves, and have parties. Now, somebody is willing to do all that out there while we're here having fun, making money, and having parties. I don't mind picking up my share of the tab. Okay. So Caesar's first, pay Caesar first, then what you've got left after Caesar needs to be divided up. In the book, The Richest Man in Babylon, gives you some suggestions on how to divide up your money and where to put it so that you'll have a good plan. Everybody needs a financial plan because here's how you surely wind up broke, spend all you make. D, you just wind up broke. Now, in those early days, I spent more than I made. That's why I'm making it down to budget finance to finance the deficit in my spending. Okay, some suggestions on what to do with the money you've got left now after taxes. One has learned to be enterprising. Profits are better than wages. Everybody should turn part of their income, even if it's from wages, into capital and become a capitalist. The healthier the country becomes is going to be a result of more and more people becoming capitalists, not just letting big business be the capitalists. Now, communism teaches that all capital should be in the hands of the state, and we should take it out of the hands of the individuals because they're too dumb and stupid to know what to do with it. All we want them to do is just show up and do their work and go home and behave themselves and stay out of trouble, and we will take care of the capital, the government. Now, see, in this country, we don't believe that. Communism teaches everybody should blend into the mass to the glory of the state, and we all say, heck with that. The state is the servant, and all glory to the individual. That's what we believe in capitalism. Take the capital and divide it up among all the people and let the people start a business. Start this thing going with commerce and interchange of goods and services, and you will create a dynamic society unprecedented in the history of the world. And we've proven that that's true. But see, communism says give the state all the capital, and we don't believe that. We believe that everybody ought to be capitalist, use it in their own way. 
They'll think of things the state can't think of, and they'll react much quicker than the state will. The state's always two, three, four years late. Government's always late, and they always spend too much money, right? Capital ought to be in the hands of the individuals. Now, if you don't use capital and become a capitalist, and you don't, and you don't, and everybody doesn't, pretty soon, guess what? Now, the capital will all start going toward the state because the society has to survive. Now, these are just some of my personal opinions, but I'm entitled to those, right? I don't even claim they're right, I just claim they're my opinions. That way, I'm off the hook. But anyway, be a capitalist. Make sure you've turned part of your income into capital and so you can teach kids how to be enterprising and capitalist from the time they're little. Just little kids, you'll teach them how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent to earn money, okay. And teach kids how to earn money, not just get a job. Teach them how to be enterprising, teach them how to sell. One of the best ways to learn about life is just to get out and sell something. And little kids can sell. Teach them how to buy a bottle of soap for two dollars and sell it for three right down the street. Your market's next door. You don't have to go very far. Teach kids how to knock on doors. Say, Miss Brown, I got this soap. It's the finest in the world. Teach them how to do that. And then teach them all the advantages of being a kid. Some people will buy from you just because you're little. They will. It's an advantage, and the littler, the better. So, you teach them how to be little, and you've got to hurry because you won't be little forever, right? Get out there and take advantage. So, the little kid knocks on the door and says, Miss Brown, I've got this soap, it only costs three dollars, and it's the best there is, and I'm your neighbor, I can take care of you, you should buy it. And besides, I'm little. Miss Brown says, hey, I appreciate you coming by, that's really nice, I appreciate that. But look, I've already got plenty of soap. Little kid says, well, let me come in and check. See, kids don't mind doing that, right? I mean, they know how to overcome objections. You don't need to give them classes, they're incredible. Now, a little kid makes a sale, got three dollars. Now, what you got to do is not only teach them how to earn the three dollars, how to get the three by making a sale, now you've got to teach them what to do with the money. Now, it's very simple, what to do with two dollars, right? Set it aside so you can buy another bottle of soap. Kid says, well, that makes sense, otherwise, you'd be out of business. That's right, and I know some adults are a little short on that information. So, you got to set aside, too. Kid says, okay, then I got a dollar to spend. Say, no, no, if you spend that, you'll wind up like most people, age 65, broke. And then take them to that part of town where people are 65 and broke and let them walk around the neighborhood, drive around. And the kid says, oh, I don't want to live like this. Say, fine. Now, here's what you do with your money. Sometimes you've got to go and touch and look and see. See what you don't want so that you'll make arrangements over here not to ever be there. What was that little movie they came out with where they took the kids to the jail? Scared straight. Let them visit with the prisoners, right? And firsthand they looked around, saw these bars in the jail prisons, talked to some of the prisoners, and firsthand got somebody to say, whatever you do, don't come here. Now, that's not some minister saying, don't go there. That's the man saying, don't come here, whatever you do. Let me show you what it's like. Here's where I had to sleep. I can't get out. I've got 15 more years to spend here. Kids' eyes get about this big, saying, I don't ever want to wind up here. See, that's good, right? And to teach us all, we've just got to go where it is where people have had the wrong plan, and that's sad, right? To look back and say, I picked up the wrong plan at age 20. Look where I am. Who talked me into this plan? I bought the wrong plan. So then the kid says, okay, what will I do with my dollar? Here's what you do with your dollar. 0, 0.10 is for the increase of capital, and everybody ought to have the same plan. 0 0.10 out of every dollar should be for the increase of capital. Now, see, the kid understands this right away, says, well, that's true. If you saved up your dimes and could buy two bottles of soap instead of one, you save yourself a trip. That's right. Now, not only do you save yourself a trip, some people will sell you two bottles cheaper than one. You buy one bottle for two dollars, they sell you two bottles for three dollars and eighty cents. 
Kid says, how clever. Then when you sell it, you make more money. That's right. That's why you've got to accumulate your capital, because everybody benefits from it. They get to sell two bottles instead of one at a time. So it's better for them, and it's better for you, and it's better for everybody. Now you're starting to teach commerce, capitalism, how to earn money, how to be responsible, and mainly what to do with it. Here's another 0, 0.10. Another 0, 0.10 is to give charity. I really should have put that first, right after Caesar. Jesus said, pay Caesar first, then pay God charity. Some churches teach 10%, that's good, like give it to the church and let the church distribute it however, or distribute it yourself, whatever. But make sure you put back part of what you take out. Charity. Some people are less fortunate, some people live tragic lives, and they need our help. So, 10% set aside to help those that are unfortunate, cannot help themselves. 0 0.10 Forgiving. And a good time to learn 0 0.10 forgiving is when you're little, because see, it's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar. What's a little more difficult is to give $100,000 out of a million. Somebody says, oh, if I had a million, I'd give $100,000. I'm not that sure. That's a lot of money. We'd better learn it now just in case, you know, you get the big stuff and won't turn loose of it. So develop the habit now of the 0 0.10, right? Kids should learn the first dollar you get. You should learn how to divide it up. Because if you let a kid, when he gets his first dollar, spend it all, you've already started them on the wrong habit pattern. Now what if they do that the rest of their life? They will be in serious trouble. So you've got to teach them what to do with the first dollar, the first dollar, or as quickly as possible. Correct what might be wrong. So, 0 0.10 for charity, 0 0.10 for the increase of capital, and 0 0.10 more cents is for investing. Now at first, use that 0 0.10 thinking. The richest man in Babylon says use 10 cents to pay off all your bills, which is good. Now, you can start using it for investing, but pay off all your bills first. All the little accumulation of credit cards and all that stuff. There's a Bible phrase that says, the borrower is servant to the lender. And as quickly as possible, you don't want to be a servant anymore. What you want to be is a lender, not a borrower. Get on the other side of the table as soon as you can. The borrower is servant to the lender. Now, once you've got all those little bills paid off, just cleaned up all the little bills, Arnold's, Leno, everything, all that stuff. Just clean all that up, now you've got some money to invest. Now here's where you should invest some of your money. Savings accounts, financial institutions. So that it provides a larger capital pool for successful people to borrow and start big businesses than you, at first, can't start, build big factories and employ lots of people. There needs to be a collection of capital so that people can borrow it, and guess what they will do when they borrow your money? Pay you for the use of it. So you teach kids how to put their money, savings accounts, financial institutions, in Australia not long ago. A man said to me, I'm recommending everybody put their money in gold. Take it out of all the banks. I said, then you'll bankrupt the country. You can't do something and teach it to everybody else that's going to bankrupt the country. You can't be totally self-protective. You must care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs if you're going to drive on this society's streets and indulge in society's commerce and goods and services in the community. You've got to do your share to care and feed the goose. You can't grab yours and put it in gold and hide it in the ground because if everybody did that, we would have no society. So you can't teach something that, if everybody did, would wreck the whole thing. He said, well, I never thought about that. I said, that's obvious, right? Now, you must ponder what's going to help all of society. Somebody says, well, I'm going to grab everything I got, barricade myself, go off to a cave in the mountains and wait with the gun. Well, if everybody did that, then the world would be over, then God would have to start all over again, which he's done on occasion, but most people didn't enjoy the process. So what's going to help everybody? What's going to help commerce? What can I do on my part on taxes and my part on savings and my part on helping financial institutions that will build businesses and employ more people and keep the health of the country going and alive? You just have to think, not just about yourself. Self-thinking is for the development of skills. Now, we need to think also outward about what can I do, my part, 
my 0 0.10, my percentage. And you can teach this to kids. Put your money in financial institutions. Kid says, well, do you get it back? Sure, you get it back. They borrow it for a while and give it back to you, and they also pay you interest on it. They pay you money for using it. Kid says, how clever. And then you give them the blockbuster. He says, yeah, but what do they pay kids? And you give them the good news. Same rate as they pay adults. Now you can start acting big because now, number one, you're a lender instead of a borrower, and you're getting paid as much as adults. Even if you're 10, they pay you the same percentage. Kid says, wow. Now then, you also have to teach kids how to be happy taxpayers because kids become taxpayers as soon as they spend money. They go down to the local store, spend 50 cents. Shopkeeper wants what? Three more pens. Kid says, well, what's that for? Who gets that money? Now, at age 10, he's a taxpayer. Three cents he's got to cough up out of his hard-earned money. He earned it, it's his. It says, the shopkeeper says you got to give me three cents. It's taxes. Little kid says, well, I'm only 10. Doesn't matter. At 10, you become a taxpayer. Now you've got to teach kids how to be happy taxpayers and what the three cents is for. Otherwise, they will be confused. So you teach them what the three cents is for. See, well, see the sidewalks on the streets? Everybody can't make their portion of the street. You don't have the equipment. So what we do is we all gather up this one money from all of us. And we pay somebody to build these streets and these sidewalks so you have something to ride your bicycle on and you can go places. Kid says, well, that makes sense. Then here's my three cents. I'll make my contribution. It's part of the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden eggs. And then you also teach kids, see the police car going there? You own that. It's yours, and the guy and it's one of your servants, called public servant. So at age 10, you got some servants. Servants taking care, keeping the bullies away. When you get in trouble, give a call. See, once kids understand, once people understand where the money goes, what's it for? Make the happy contribution. Divide up your money gladly instead of reluctantly. Then you can just change a lot of this inner turmoil. And you get more excited about participating and doing your part and learning skills and growing so that you become an incredibly unique part of society rather than a reluctant part, a foot-dragging part, an unhappy part, and a miserable part. And you do it with animosity instead of joy. See, you can imagine what the complex of society and how it would change if everybody had those feelings. But if enough of us do, see, we'll be able to affect all the others, at least in some measure. What do you do with your money? So now we've got 30% set aside. Learn to live on 70. Okay. Caesar first, then God. 10 cents for the increase of capital, 10 cents to invest, live on 70. Now, once you get doing extremely well, you can even start living on less and less and less because the amount is more and more and more. Now, a few more tips on financial independence, and we'll take our first break here. They are, number one, if you haven't done it in a long time, put together a financial statement on yourself. A financial statement simply is a piece of paper divided in half, and on one side is all a list of your assets, the value of your assets. On the other side of the paper is all that you owe, called liabilities. Then you subtract one from the other, and that now is called your net worth. Mr. Shop asked me, have you put together a financial statement recently? I said I've never put together one. He says, well, now is the time to do it. And I wasn't too happy about putting together that first one. I said, well, it's not going to look that good. He said, it doesn't matter how it looks. You've got to have one to get where you want to go. First of all, you've got to know where you are. Say, where am I? Without kidding anybody. Okay, now this first financial statement, you don't have to publish it in a public record. It's for your own private eyes to see, but you've got to see where you are. Take a look. Now, when I put my first one together, I had no problem on the liability side. I mean, that was a long list. Budget finance, they were all on there. Money I borrowed from my parents, I mean, it was all on there. Right on the asset side though, I really started scraping the bottom of the barrel. I put the value of my shoes on there. I put, shoes. They're worth ten dollars at least, right? I mean, I'm scraping so I won't look so bad, right? 
But anyway, so if you put together your first one right, you know, whatever you've got to do, make it look as good as you can. But also make sure it's accurate and make sure you take a good look at where you are. Now then, play this financial independence program like a game. Be delighted in reducing your liabilities and increasing your assets. Once I got the hang of this, I started putting together a financial statement about every 30 days. Sometimes even less if I knew the picture had changed quite a bit. I'd draw me up a new financial statement so I could put away the old one. Here's my new one. You just play it like a game. And then learn to be excited about reducing your liabilities. Shop taught me how to pay my bills with enthusiasm. Now, see, that was a whole new thing for me. He said, the next time you pay $100 on an account, put a little note in there and say, with great excitement, I send you this. He says, you won't believe what it'll do on the other end. Right? When they get that note. But he says, most importantly of all, you won't believe what it'll do on your end. Now, starting to part with your money with excitement, with enthusiasm, he started changing my whole opinion about money, and about paying my bills, and about capital, and learning to live within restricted limits. He got me excited about it. And see, a big part of what you do with your plan is going to be your attitude about it. So develop a whole new attitude about your money. Remember, it's not the amounts that count, it's the attitude and the plan. He got me to open up my first savings account. And he said, go down there with excitement and open it up. I never had a savings account. So I told him, I said, well, I don't have any money to open up a savings account. He said, have you got $10? I said, well, I got $10. He said, then go get it open. It's not the amount, it's the plan. So I marched down to the bank and opened up my first savings account. Now, that took a little bit. I'm a grown man, and I said to the lady that waited on me there at the bank, I said, I want to open up a savings account. She said, fine, what's your name? I said, Mr. Rowan. She said, Mr. Rowan, just fill this out. I said, okay. So I filled it out. I said, there it is. She looked it over and she said, that's fine. She said, how are we going to get this started? I said, put $10 in. She said, 10 what? I said, Ten, ten dollars. Now, Shaf said, be enthusiastic. Now, see, I had trouble there. I'm 25, I'm married, my family's starting, I'm working, and I've been to college, and I'm opening up my first savings account with only ten dollars. Now, that was tough. But Shaf said, swallow hard and just go do it. Do it with excitement because it'll change. It's the plan that counts, and not the amount. Wow. So I put the ten dollars in. I said, hey, this doesn't look like much. But I said, I'll tell you what. Before long, I will have the largest savings account in this bank. She said, well, if you say so. Guess what? Within less than two years, I had the largest savings account in that bank. In less than two years. Shaf was right. It wasn't the amount. It was the attitude. It was my new plan. I got excited about rearranging my life, putting it together. Here's a couple more. Keep strict accounts. Have you ever heard the old expression, I don't know where it all goes? Let me give you probably one of the most important phrases of the whole weekend. You've got to know where it all goes. You just got to know. No. The Rockefeller boys said their father. Grandfather made them keep track of every penny they got and where it went. It's called habit. You just got to know where it's going, what's happening. Get a handle on it. It's part of how you become financially independent because I found out. Even early in the game when I was making some pretty good money, I found out you could make $5,000 a month and go broke. Somebody says, how could you go broke making $5,000 a month? It's easy, $6,000 or 9 months from Thursday it's over. If your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. You got to know where it goes. So keep strict accounts. Now, then, when you can start investing, begin a small side business. Engage in some buying and selling. Some individuals in this region have become incredibly wealthy in real estate over the last 12 to 15 years. It's unbelievable. Be on the lookout for opportunities to buy. For us collectively, in conducting business, we have someone who specializes in seeking out investments. But until you can afford that luxury, where people can find places to put your money to get the best advantage of making it useful as well as making money, You've got to be sharp enough on your own to do some buying and selling.
You can even teach kids how to make proper investments. What if kids bought light bulbs three years ago and just put them aside? They could have gone down to the Safeway, bought them, brought them home, and stashed them under the bed or in the closet. Three years ago, what would they be worth today? Two or three times as much as they were three years ago. How would you like to make that kind of return on your money? Incredible, right? A kid says, light bulbs? I never thought about that. Just buy some and set them aside. Buy one, buy ten, buy a dozen, buy a hundred. Save up your money. Put them in light bulbs. Set them aside. Okay, three years later, now you've got some light bulbs to sell at an incredibly inflated price. The kid says, yeah, where do you sell light bulbs? Same people that are buying your soap, just right down the street. Financial independence. Put your plan together and get your family excited about it. Get the kids excited about it. Get the husband excited. Get the wife excited. This is something that if everybody works on, if everybody has a financial statement, if everybody knows where it's going, and everybody has a celebration every once in a while when the assets are going up and the liabilities are coming down and the net worth is changing, make it a source of celebration. We're among an incredible group. In comparing financial statements, I think the major guy in our group is worth about $50 million. So, you know, he becomes an incredible incentive for the rest of us. It's nice to have somebody around that's carrying that kind of heavy. Right? It gives you something to shoot for. You're looking, yeah, I'm looking pretty good, and then you see somebody else's financial statements. Well, I've got a little ways to go. But anyway, play it like a game. Get excited about it. Develop the skills in how to earn money, thinking of enterprises, investments. Developing more skills so you can earn more money, but then have an incredibly excellent plan on what to do with your money. And sure enough, very quickly, the first year, the second year, the third year, you can't believe the changes that'll start to be made. And the major change, of course, is in your own self-confidence. And that's where riches come from. Self-confidence. It's not the growing bank account. It's your growing awareness that you're in charge. You've got a plan. You're on track. It's changing because you changed it. It's different because you made it different. It's growing because you made certain commitments to yourself. And those kinds of feelings are where the treasure is, because the true treasure is in personal development. Happiness is not contained in what you get. Happiness is contained in what you become. But sure enough, what you become is related to what you get. So you can take a look at what you've gotten and have great satisfaction that you're the one that designed it. You're the one that defined it. You just didn't let it drift and drift and get into trouble. You made the changes, you made the hard decisions. So, for your own financial independence, get the book. Get some other books, do some reading, make it a game, play it, have a plan, change your attitude, become a happy taxpayer, pay your bills with enthusiasm. Put all this together, and I'll tell you what, it'll start to change. You won't believe it. Okay, financial independence. Thanks again for listening, and make it your best year ever. Here's to your success.